Welcome to the Cosmic Reality Radio Show, produced by Colleen Kelly of Haggy Shack Radio. With Nancy Hopkins and Walt Silver from Cosmic Reality Radio, music theme song by Renata Jet and Jet Music. I assume we are live. You are live. Are we? One of the agreements says never assume. Remember one of the four agreements? The Dali always. <laughs> never oh, you're assume. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to Cosmic Reality Radio Show. It's April 10th, 2018. This is Cosmic Reality uh, being... We're, we're, Gaggy Shack is producing and we're simulcasting. Uh, the show and Walt Silva is with me and Colleen Kelly is producing. How are you doing, Walt? Hello, how are you? I'm not what sure. Been, oh. I've been uh, I've been on radio since twelve noon today. Wow, it's a good <laughs> thing you got the toilet seat for the desk. How'd you know that? <laughs> Never try to uh, cheat a psychic, you know. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. So what's happening up there in Michigan? Are you um, Minnesota? Michigan? I don't know. Minnesota. 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 <laughs> no, I was talking to somebody earlier about Flint, Michigan. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway. There's, what, they're snowing a lot, too. No, we were talking about the fact that the water thing is still having – they're still having problems with it. Oh, wow. And the governor just said that the uh, crisis was over, but it's only over for the rich people. <laughs> you know, the rest of the people that had the bad water eat their copper to a point that the copper is poisoning them. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they're still in the same boat. And it was, uh, but anyway, let's not talk about that. <laughs> it's too well, they're, they're like almost, they're like almost in the, they're living in the same, com- uh, uh, they're living in the same, under the same conditions as the city of Carlos Paz in Cordoba, uh, in Argentina. In the geographic center of the country, there's a state called Cordoba, and within it, there's a town that's uh, has a. Rep- it's the same. It's like you remember in, like, in Florida, Fort Lauderdale is like every time there's spring break, that's where all the kids go to Fort Lauderdale, and they have parties and stuff like that, and they have clubs. Carlos Paz is the same way. It's full of hotels, and it's a known spot for honeymooners and college spring breaks. But here's the thing. I mean, nobody questions this. Nobody complains it. Um, you can't drink the water anywhere. Zero. Everybody and their dog walks around with a bottle of water because all the water that comes out of the tap, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're in a hotel or a private home. The water that comes out of the tap comes out brown because it's the water from the river. They just pipe the river into your faucet. That's about it. If there's trucks, dogs, cats, dead pigeons, and whatever is in the river is coming out of your faucet. So it, it's just life as usual for them. Nobody drinks anything that comes out of the tap. And it's a uh, wherever you go. I mean, even even businesses that have nothing to do with water, they're selling bottles of water. And everybody's walking around with their shopping bags full of bottles of water. And no, <laughs> nobody says a peep. And I'm thinking, this passes for normal here? I thought hotels, you know, being what they are, that they're a business of, you know, giving room and board to people, that they would have some kind of filtration unit in the in the roof or the water in the hotel. No, no, they just pipe the river into the faucet and so, so I guess they could they could uh they could call Flint, Michigan their sister city, huh? You know? Those those things, those places where they have sister cities. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yeah, you just can't imagine why people would go there. I mean, you know, sometimes uh, human beings can be so gullible, so stupid, so 
absolutely worthless that you want to go, oh, let's just pull the plug, forget it, you know? Yeah. And thank God that we know people that are just the opposite. And um, hopefully someday the the rest of the world will, um, I don't know, I don't know. You know, be somehow or another transformed into living human beings that are the human beings we want them to be. Like us. <laughs> Common sense people practicing the golden rule. No, I don't rule. want people like us. I want better. I'm more ambitious than you. <laughs> oh, come on. Better? Better than us? <laughs> this I can't imagine. <laughs> So, uh, what, what is it? What's happening up there? You got, is it still snowing? No, it's, it snowed that day, but, uh, in the morning, the snow must have been like a, an inch thick and it melted right away because it's, it's not cold enough. I mean, when, when winter settles in, it'll be below zero for weeks on end. That's why, you know, there's so much ice activity, ice fishing and everything else that happens on the ice. But it's, it, that part of winter is, is over. It's, it's right outside, like right now, it's like 34, 35. So yeah, there's snow on the ground, but, uh, there, there is no new snow. What, what snowed melted away under the, under the influence of the sun. So right now it's just overcast, but there's you, no, no storm. You have 30 degree weather? Yep. It was 91 here yesterday. Mmm. And dry. What, did you get some rain? Oh no, we're, we're, we're in a drought. We're in trouble. Mm. They're not talking about it, but I know. I can see what's happening to my yard. I've got bushes that are burnt. They're all, they're burnt by the sun. Mm. I mean, they they look like somebody took a magnifying glass to them, put little burn marks all over. That's the, that's the thing. Oh no, I was going to say in thinking about that situation that you're describing, um, I was able to confirm. Myself, um, the, the work that the, those cloud busters that, um, Don Croft developed, they really do what he claims they do. Um, because you know, I, I've said it before in, in other shows that I started, uh, studying everything and reading everything I could get my hands on regarding organite and this whole Oregon thing, Oregon, organite gifting and all this stuff. Uh, from any writer that I could get my hands on. And then I, when I came across the Don Croft information, um, I had already read about Wilhelm Reich and his work with uh, what he called the cloud buster, where he could either clean the sky or put moisture in the sky to make it rain. And he was really impressed when he, he found that whole swatches of desert in the U.S. and the Midwest were not being caused by actual lack of moisture. It was the presence of too much stagnant organ in the sky. It was just parked there. So what he started doing is he started pulling all that dead argon from the sky over these areas. And within a week's time, there were grasses growing everywhere. And, and it hadn't rained at all. It hadn't rained. It's just, just by removing all that dead organ, uh, nature started coming back. So um, in reading about uh, the, all this whole thing with the cloud busters and everything, uh, one of the pieces of information that Don Croft gave as to the influence of his cloud busters is he, he did not claim that it made it rain or it made it dry. It, he said that it, would, it was balancing those energies between the earth and sky. So he had found both situations happening and he, he described it when what part of the words in because he had I think he traveled to Africa, he took uh one or more cloud busters there or somebody there built them. But the thing is that he did actually get a chance to travel there and he came across both situations. There were places where it was raining uncontrollably, you know, days after and you know, days on end, which is bad. Too much rain, you know, it, it hurts vegetation when there's excessive moisture, excessive water, and then drought is just as bad. So what he found is when he would install this thing, um, it would balance that out. If there was excessive raining, it would clear up. Things would 
balance out. And if there was drought, uh, it would start bringing in moisture and you would get rainfall. When I came to Minnesota in 2003, um, it was already the second year in a terrible drought. Uh, the, the police themselves were driving around making sure that nobody was watering their lawns because they were in such a terrible drought. I mean, wherever you drove, it was so sad to see the, the depleted vegetation because they do have a lot of vegetation here. It's very lush. But wherever you drove, people's homes, their lawns were brown and yellow. I mean, you threw a match into the lawn, it would just catch fire. It was so bad. So, and I think it was at the end of, was it, yeah, in the summer of 2004, I put up my very first cloud buster that I made using a little bucket. You know, I got, I got whatever I could get. <laughs> I bought whatever I could buy and did my best to replicate his uh, cloud buster. And I didn't bury it, which is the, the ideal way to do it. Just bury it in the ground and let the pipes stick out. I, this was just sitting on the backyard. And right in the the on the second day of me putting it out, we had a little bit of rain. And then as the days progress, there would be more like each week there would be one or two days with, with some precipitation. And then it started, it started balancing and balancing and it kept on going. So by now I've built uh, three. I have one right behind the house. Uh, but ever since then, I'm, I'm not going to say, Oh, I'm, I'm a genius. I'm a wizard. You know, I fixed Minnesota. No, I, I think it may have been other factors, but at least I was able to, uh, witness this balancing effect that he describes for the cloud buster. We started balancing out. Right now we're not, there hasn't been a drought here since then. You know, there's, there's a balanced amount of precipitation. There's not an excess and there's not a shortage. I think I better order one of them. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I told you about the crazy ass story where I was, I was working in the condominium. So I was working eight to, to, um, a midnight to eight. And I go into the boiler room, which is a huge, huge place. It's got boilers and AC units bigger than most people's houses. So I go in there, and I'm butzing around, and I see this piece of copper pipe. It's about four feet tall, and it's a, a four-inch diameter. And it's just laying there, and I hear this, take it. And I I ain't going to take it. It's not mine. I'm not going to take it. You know, <laughs> I don't know what it's doing here, but it, I'm not going to take it. Well, I had an eight-hour shift, and every time I went back into the boiler room, I have to go in periodically, just check everything out, take it. You know, and it got became so persistent, I said, all right, all right, I will take it. And I put it in my car, and I figure, I'll see if they got me doing something with this or if I'm some kind of a, you know, kleptomaniac thief that I didn't realize I was. What and, was it again? Uh, Sorry? What, what it was, was it again? Copper pipe. Oh, copper pipe, okay. Four foot in length and about four inches in diameter. Mm. And uh, so I go home and I forgot it's even in the car. And then I hear like, okay, you got to get this thing. And, and, and they also are directing me to get a uh, geometric uh, sculptured thing with copper piping. I don't even <laughs> know how to explain it. It was like a friend of mine was working with pipes and making geometric shapes and, you know, and uh, I had a number of his his devices around, and they said, "No, you got to take this, and you got to take the the four foot pipe." And okay, so I go out into the yard, in the front yard, and I'm going like, "Okay, so where do you want this?" And it was like I figured, if they were building some energy device, they wanted to be in a vortex, and I knew where I thought all the vortexes were. And no, 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 no. And finally, they lead me over to a place in the yard I'd never been before. And I didn't feel vortex. I didn't feel really much energy in this area at all. And they had me uh, t- take a, a sledgehammer and pound the, the four foot down so that three feet of it was still sticking above the earth and then put this geometric shape thing on top of it. And I'm looking at it and I'm going like, okay. And I'm waiting and I'm going like, okay, I don't feel anything. And I'm getting no response. They're not saying anything to me. It's like, boop, okay. So I go on about my business. I figure, well, they'll let me know when I'm supposed to do something more, get my attention. 
But what got my attention was um, my partner at the time, and I told him what, what had happened, and he, he was like, hmm, let's see what this is about. And uh, about, I would say, an hour and a half after this, I get a call from him, and he says to me, get that thing out of the earth. And I said, why, what? And he said, just get it out, pull it out. And he said, I'll, I'll be here, just go get it out. And I went, all right. So I ran out there, and I trusted him enough, and I disconnected the – I took the top part off of it. And I'm looking at it. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know what's wrong, but I'll pull that one out too. So I pull out the, the copper thing, and uh, I just lay him down, and I go back in. And he said, turn your television on. And I'm like, okay. And I turn the television on, and there's warnings. All I mean, every station had this incredible warning that there was some – that Florida was being hit, South Florida was being hit with like something like 15,000 hits of lightning every minute. It was like <laughs> unbelievable. They, I mean, the television was saying, get under, you know, and um, I said, you think that's what had did it? And he says, I think that's what did it. And I'm going like, whoa, you know, well, it's, then all of a sudden everything stopped and, you know, it never made the papers. It never, nobody ever talked about it because it was just such, so freaky. Wow. You know, um, <laughs> and to me, it was just a demonstration of the power of these devices that I'd been playing with, but didn't really understand much of it. And now, because I've met you, I understand that this was probably some super duper cloud busting. Who knows? You know, because it was. Well, that was kind of excessive, though. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> well, there, ever, is, if, there is something ever, to be said for that excess lightning. Um, I always remember what Dr. Costa said, that the positive thing of lightning storms is that they clean up huge, you know, huge uh, areas of, um, how, how did he say it? It cleans up human consciousness. Like when there's too much crap thoughts floating around, it's like passing, you know, you know what happens if you take a big magnet and you swipe it across a videotape, you wipe out the videotape. That's what that huge lightning storms do. They actually clear up the, the, um, the atmospheric consciousness, the collective consciousness. Oh, that's very interesting because you do know that Florida does get more. It's the lightning capital of the world. Mm. We got a lot of dumbasses down here. They have to work overtime to clear. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, but that was um, – so, yeah, I guess I better order one of those from you because I I went out there and I I did dance. I did dance for Raina, and, and, you know, I get a few dribbles. It's like, yeah, okay, give her a few dribbles, make her feel right. It's not enough. Dance faster. <laughs> or get, go talk to Walt and get a cloud buster. Uh, are you there? I'm here. I was just muted so you couldn't hear the keyboard. Oh? Oh, are you talking to somebody in chat? Someone has a question. What? Someone has a question. What? What? What's that question? Um, I'd love to make a cloud buster but live in a city apartment. What could I use instead? Would love to help clean up the sky, the city. So I always wondered about that and I always wondered if, if, if an apartment has um, a balcony and you have a view of the sky if if it could be done like at an angle instead of straight up because normally they bury them in the ground and the pipes are uh, pipe, you know, pointing straight up but I always wondered uh, they can be made at an angle so as long as it's you're pointing to the sky um, they can because the, the, they work the best work is when they're grounded to the earth so that's why when I, the last one that I made that I put in, I got, I didn't put it. I shipped it and the person put it in the ground in California. I specifically made it so there would be these metal studs sticking out of the bottom. So they're in touch with the earth. So there is an energy flow between the device and the earth itself. So as long as I, I have no issues, you know, you could have a, you could make a grounding strap for the device, and as long as you can plug it into the ground line of some outlet, then the device would be grounded, and then you, it would do the, the work. And I guess if, you, if you're living and you have a balcony, but there's another balcony on top of you, uh, you could make the 
pipe segments at an angle so that they end up pointing to the sky anyway, even though it, there might be a balcony above you. Uh, being at an angle doesn't degrade. I mean, in fact, the cloud busters that, um, that Wilhelm Reich built, if you look at them, they look like those uh, anti-aircraft cannons, you know, the way it was mounted on a, on a swivel base. So he could point, point it in any direction and at any angle, you know, up, down. Uh, as long as it's grounded, it's, it's having, it's having a, a, a circulation between the earth and the sky. Yeah, but what if, what if you got this thing pointed at another apartment building? Uh, why would you do that? Well, because you accidentally, I mean, I'm thinking I'm a, I'm in New York City, right? And I know you've lived in New York City. You yeah. know, where, I mean, like if you try to get a TV dish thing out there, you know, where is the sky? And, you know, it would be easy for us to say, you know, yeah, point it off into the direction of the sky, but th- this is, this is energy. Oh, I, I lived in a six family home for a six family building for 20 years and it was only two stories. And uh, all the buildings surrounding us were two-story buildings, so I had a fantastic view of the sky. Uh, now, if you're living in Wall Street, yeah, you'll never see the sky. If you look up, all you see is skyline. <laughs> so I guess it depends where you are in New York. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that you, if you've got a, let's say you've got a four-inch diameter pipe, the energy coming off of that is likely when it gets to, you know, let's say a couple of blocks down the street, it could influence somebody somebody down there because it's now wider than four inches. Well, uh, I would I don't, never make anything with that type of pipe. I mean, all, all the cloud buses I've made, are, they're using inch pipe, six, six of them. You don't need such a huge uh, piece of pipe. That was uh, obviously something special that they had you put together. Well, yeah, but my my point here, Walt, <laughs> is that it's like a loaded gun, and you don't know exactly where you're pointing it, even if you think you're pointing it at. The, I I don't feel comfortable telling people in in you know like cities, yeah, make one of these things and point it at the sky, because effectively, didn't Wilhelm have an accident where he bumped up against one of these and caused himself a physical? No, problem? not him. It was uh. When he was out in the desert uh, cleaning up the sky, uh, I don't know if he warned his assistants, the technicians that were assisting him, or I think this guy was kind of a maverick. You know, these guys, you know, like, oh, yeah, I can do this, you know, but, you know, you're, you, there are people like that. You, you've met them. You warn them and you try to tell them, you know, be careful with this, be careful with that, but, oh, they know it all. You, you can't tell them because they're already on top of it. They know what the heck's going on. So... The, before they had a chance to ground the device, because they were literally, before they started using it, the first thing they would do is park it and ground it. Either they're strapping it to metal uh, pipes being hammered into the ground, or they would, uh, if they were near water wells, they would drop a weight into, uh, uh, you know, a wire into a well, make sure that it hit the water. So the device would be grounded into the aquifer itself. But this guy, the um, cloud buster, was pointed to the sky, and he's moving around it. And then at one point, his leg brushes against the base, and, it dis- and the discharge went through his leg. And from that moment on, he, he was like handicapped. His leg was partially paralyzed because... Think about it. Cloud busters move etheric energy. Your etheric body is made up of etheric energy. So in essence, even though there was no physical damage, there was etheric damage done to his etheric body. It, it, would, it got damaged by that, the discharge. I mean, by, by now, we know so many energy healers. I'm sure an energy healer would have been able to rebuild his etheric leg without a problem. But we are talking about the 1940s. I don't know how many energy healers were around that time. Well, having experienced something similar, <laughs> do you remember when I got zapped by the neutrino? Oh, um, yeah. You, you had, uh, you had uh, if, whenever you would put your arm in a certain position, it would hurt. Oh, you sometimes, couldn't. sometimes I didn't. I mean, it, w- it was hurting all the time. It, for six mm-hmm. months, I had problems with that that shoulder. Everything. I mean, we tried. We tried sound. We tried 
different shungite nothing 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 was was helping this um and i got to the point where i said i've either done some physical damage or somehow or another i've got an arthritic shoulder and because nothing energetically was was healing it i'm thinking maybe it's just an arthritic you know thing and when i reached back quickly i did something to it but then i got and this was this was an odd thing what what got rid of it was the um uh the shungite sav made by the wax from the bees mm. derek sent me some of this this wax this shungite wax stuff and um i i was i had not been out of pain so i said well this is the thing that tests everything and i put it on there boom gone mm. And it did not, I mean, I do, I do think that there is probably arth- arthritis in that area. Um, from, I mean, minor, a minor flare up. And I put that on there, boom, gone. Um, yeah, because again, it's just energy and, uh, you, the Shanghai corrected it because it's always fixing the spin of things. So if you had energy stuck there, counterclockwise energy, it, it well, got corrected. Then- this was more than Shungite. I'd used every Shungite product we have. This was the bees. Oh, this yeah. Was the, this was the Shungite bees. They have a healing power that that's one of the reasons that I get so into uh, Valerie Solheim and, and the, the sounds from the beehives. Because yeah, exactly. the frequency of those sounds are healing. At the th- at more like exactly the etheric than the 3D even, but it, you gotta fix the etheric before the 3D gets fixed. Mm-hmm. So fix the etheric and pretty soon the 3D will come into, um, alignment. Correct. But, um, I do believe, but, but anyway, it was, it was a, a, a bizarre thing that I had done. I had crossed a neutrino beam, not realizing what I was about to do. As soon as I did it, I knew. I bet that guy knew right away too. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> I, I also, uh, because remember, I mentioned I, I read everything that I could find on the subject. Um, I did not remember where or what the name of this doctor is, but he, the guy, I, I take it he's still alive. He he is a doctor and he had a medical practice, and I don't know the specific what if he was a chiropractor or something else. But he was treating patients with a, uh, a desktop version of a cloud buster as Wilhelm Reich designed it to look like a little cannon on a civil, civil base so that you can aim it and point it and, or, and change the angle and everything. But this was a small unit that would sit on top of a desk. And he was using this to treat people, I guess, uh, just removing from their bodies stuck energies and stuff like that. Um, there weren't any technical specifics on the device on the article that I read indicating how he had it set up, uh, whether it was properly grounded to earth ground. But he had to stop doing it because he was picking up what the device was taking out of people. He started getting sick. <laughs> so, so it's not a toy. You know, etheric energy is, is uh, you know, it dominates matter, so... It's not that something to be played with, so that's why grounding is so important on all of these things because that's that's where you get into trouble. It's, it needs it needs somewhere to go, and you want to send it into ground. Don't send it into your body. <laughs> well, I think one of the reasons that I I of the, of, of our group um, tend to be more cautious than other people is because I have seen the consequences of walking into it blind. Mm-hmm. Um, one example I just gave you with that four inch pipe. But another one was I was working, with, I was doing all sorts of energy devices, not using the copper spirals or anything, but by, because I had such a massive amount of, of minerals and I was mm-hmm. using copper pyramids. But I was developing, I, I would try different uh, combinations of uh, geometry and the placement of different minerals to see what was happening. And these things were getting kind of complex to the point that I had uh, a table and the table had a huge piece of uh, quartz slab on it. And I would make a device above the table and then I would make a device below the table. 
and I had um, this 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 one. It was like it was like a masterpiece, and it was extremely powerful. And I'm like, and it was I had a, a screen room, okay, so it was inside the screen room, and um, I'm like watching the energies and trying to figure out, you know, how they're interacting and just you know trying to learn about it. And Peter comes over, and you know Peter, he's he's my old time friend. He's gone through all this with me. And Peter comes over and it's like, you know, what are you doing? And da, da, da. and I'm, well, and I, we're sitting outside the screen room. And I said to him, well, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And, and so he gets up and he goes into the screen room. And I'm sitting there and I went, oh dear. And I go out and I follow him in. And he has taken his hand and he's got it inside the pyramid on the top layer. And I said, Peter, I wouldn't do that. And the next thing I know, he's falling backwards. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> right. And this guy's six foot tall and I'm like five, you know, it's like, holy crap. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I grabbed him and I pushed. I was able to stabilize him so he didn't really hurt himself or anything. But he was out of it. And I got him away from the, the system and the energy and I sat him down trying to get him grounded. It was an hour and a half before this guy was even close to being stable. Yeah. Yeah, and what am it, I supposed it, to do? Call nine one one. Well, he just got zapped yeah. by a zapper. <laughs> well, all you need to go go to the glass cabinet on the wall that says "In case of grounding, break glass," and just grab the big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and another time we were doing uh, uh, this one was real fun. I had um, developed uh, uh, it was like a wand, okay, but the wand is full of nectar powder, which is equivalent to shungite powder. And it had a coil wrapped around, what was it? It was a copper one inch pipe, okay? And it was about six inches. No, it was probably more like a foot. Yeah, it was a foot. Foot in length. And I had this, this full of this nectar powder, like I say, it was like the first version of Shungite. And then I had a copper wire wrapped around it. And on both ends of the copper wire, there was, you know, a good six inches of excess wire, so to speak. And in the bottom one, I, um, attached it to a, a, a C battery, okay, and so the C battery is feeding this electric current through the wire around this pipe that's full of this extraordinary energy, and out of the top where the where the where the 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 other length that's another six inches of um, copper is, we would take a crystal, a crystal point, probably about an inch to two. Didn't matter. Well, that's what we had in front of us because we just kept putting different things on it. But if you put it on top of the wire, uh, it would charge up. And if you let it go, it would be anti gravitational for about 18 inches before it would fall. But it, the, the battery, the, you didn't close the circuit? Where was oh, the no, other I end almost, of the battery? I almost blew up the battery. Yes, Walt. That's exactly what I almost did. <laughs> Luckily, my arm brushed against the battery and of course it was it was hot and I looked at it and it, it expanded I mean we were about to kill ourselves you know? oh god yeah that's uh... <laughs> but I mean I went into this stuff you know just hey let's try this let's try that but during that same time frame um, what happened was um, Peter was 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 connecting to the system and one of my dogs, his best friend, came running up to him and he touched him. And Luke acted like he had gotten a jolt of energy and, you know, cried out and backed up and never would go near Peter again, which yeah. was to me very sad. But see, I mean, I was, you know, all my life I've had some amazing experiences, but all my life I have been saved from some great stupidity. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I told you when we were on the show with Valerie. I mean, look at, uh, Slim Sperling, he almost killed himself like three different times with his experiments because he was his own, you know, guinea pig. What happens if I do this? I'm, ugh. So he almost cooked himself to death. He almost had a heart attack. I don't know what he did the other time because uh, he was, he would play with energy so much that uh, if you get a chance to meet different people that interacted with him, they're full of all of these weird stories. Like, remember I mentioned that his last wife, his widow, is his wife number six. Uh, when he was with one of his previous wives, um, I forget what state is, uh, I don't know, if he, where was he living in? 
Kentucky or some or Colorado. There's a place that he went with his wife where they have these mineral baths, you know, the spas where people go to soak in the, min- the hot water that comes out from the ground. Um, these buildings normally are separated. You know, the, the section over here is just for men and the section over here is just for women. So you go into these swimming pool size, uh, uh, it is like, a sw- it is a swimming pool. It's not for swimming. It's just for soaking because the water that comes out is, uh, is, is hot and full of minerals and it's not very, you know, I, they don't suggest you do physical exertion because the hot water brings down your blood pressure. So you have to acclimate yourself first. You know, you soak in and you get out and then you soak again and you get until your body gets used to being in all that hot water. So because the two sections uh, were separate, I, I think they were there with another couple. And to get from the men's section to the lobby where people are just milling around or they're sitting there talking. Uh, the story describes that there was like a semi-circular staircase. You would, got, you would come out of the locker rooms and the men, and the man, the males section of the spa, you would go up this semi-spiral staircase and you would come out on this lobby area. That's the way it's described in the story. So, um, uh, this man that's there with Slim, you know, Slim gets dressed first and says to the man, I'll meet you in the lobby. And he goes out of the locker room. And the man, just a few seconds later, follows him, uh, goes up the stair, goes to the lobby. He sees Slim's wife there. And he goes, where is Slim? Did he go to get something? And the wife says, uh, no, I haven't seen him. And he got, the man goes, but he went up. He left the locker room in front of me. And the woman goes, no, I haven't seen him. So they go around to different parts of the, of the spa there asking if they had seen this man, wondering maybe he, he went to another section or went to talk to somebody or went to get something. 45 minutes later, he's coming up the stairs. And they, and they, they, they confront him and they ask him, where have you been? And he goes, what do you mean where I've been? I just left the locker room. Yeah, you left the locker room in front of me. He says, yeah, I left the locker room and here I am. I, I went up the stairs. So for, for 45 minutes, he was somewhere else. <laughs> Nobody knows where. Even he doesn't know where. It took him 45 minutes to go up, you know, one flight of stairs. <laughs> and so his life is full of crazy stories like that. Uh, that sounds like a time warp. Exactly. Had he been playing with any of the... Was this something that started happening after he started playing with the energies? Uh, I don't know. And, and when I when I read that in one of the chapters of the book, uh, it, it didn't specify whether he had been playing with any of his devices. It was just one of the many uh, anecdotes that, you know, surround his life. And I'm sure there's many more that never made it into the book because you know, uh, at one point he... So he started getting a reputation and people would call him Merlin, you know, on top of it, you know, his white hair and long white beard. And he, he actually looked like a Merlin. <laughs> so. Because it, it reminds me of a story that Whitley Strieber talks about with his wife, Anne. Um, and they were, um, I'm trying to, oh, it was Starfire Tour, I think, that was with them. And they were in a restaurant, it was the Magic House or some kind of a club where they did magic acts and had dinner and stuff. And Anne and Starfire went to the ladies' room. And it was just a small, it was like a, an old house that had been reconverted. So the bathroom was just very, two stalls and very basic. So Whitley go, they all go and Whitley gets out before they do. And he's standing there waiting for him. And all of a sudden, a woman comes out of the the bathroom and walks by him. And he doesn't think anything of it. And then uh, Starfire and Annie come out. And they're like, did some woman just walk through the door? And he's going like, yeah. And they're looking at each other. And they said, she wasn't in the, the room. before. And then she was. She just appeared. <laughs> right, but Whitley had st- stood outside and didn't see her move into the room. 
right? So he's like, I don't know what to tell you. So, but they are absolutely certain that the woman was not in the room and suddenly appeared. And she was at the sink washing her hands, right? Yeah. And so they go back into the, uh, to the restaurant and don't you know they see the woman? And they actually went up to the woman and said, were you just in the ladies room and did something strange happen? And she said, yeah, I'm not exactly how, sure how I got there. Something to that effect. Wow. That she herself had realized that something weird had happened. You it's, know, it's, it's like... It's like uh, almost like shifting from one reality to the next. You're just not 100% sure where you're going to pop up. I'm, I've seen... I look at... The, I've seen several videos on YouTube. Um, of course, you can't swear on a stack of Bibles that the, the, the video you're watching is 100% legit because there's so much trickery that you can do with video. But at some point, you have to say, okay, this this sounds, this looks like it's legit because I don't see how anybody could play with this. But I've seen some videos and a lot of them are being filmed in in in, in Russia in areas of traffic. One of them is filmed. It, it appears to be a country road, and it's a it's a small two lane dirt road. So the you're seeing what you're, you're seeing the traffic. It's, it seems that it's very, I don't have one. I have two vehicles and yet I don't have a dash cam. I guess it's normal nowadays for people to have a dash cam. So. In, in Russia, it's virtually required because there were okay. so many accidents with so many liars. Oh, okay. So I guess that's what it, it's the dash cam because you can tell that it, whatever is filming the scene is mounted on the, on the dashboard of a car. So this vehicle is following a truck. Uh, uh, looks like a rural type of the trucks that normally carry like hay, uh, bales of hay. So the truck is you're you're behind the truck, going down the road, and then at some point there's traffic coming in the opposite direction. But the the vehicle that's coming in the opposite direction makes a maneuver to skip to try to avoid hitting something on the road. So the truck that you're behind has to do the same thing. He had to swerve in order to avoid hitting the other truck that's coming in the opposite direction. He had to make a movement. So as the truck moves toward, uh, my point of view is toward your right, so because you're behind the truck, so the, the, the vehicle is swerving a little bit toward the right, so the, the whole cargo container behind it has to sway because it's responding to the maneuver of the truck. In that action of swaying, where the, the cargo container moves a little bit to the right and then it goes back straight, when it goes back straight, a person walks out of the side of the cargo container, like he just walked in out of a movie, not even reacting to the fact that it, it, if, the, if the person had been sitting still at the side of the road, you know, it would have been, the person would have been hit by the cargo container because it had to sway in response to the movement of the of the truck pulling this cargo container, so as it sw- and, and they pass the film again in slow motion, and you see the cargo sways to the right, and when it goes back straight, the person walks out of the side like the like she just walked out of out of a curtain somewhere. <laughs> so so you 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 visually see somebody come into the cargo. From the outside into the cargo truck. No, it, like it's like she's walking out of the cargo truck. She's she's moving to the right to to, to the side of the road. Oh, so and, she's, and walk, she's walking walking out, out of, of the truck, out of the truck. So okay. and it's like she just stepped out of through a, a theater curtain or something. Okay, but was she? Um, I mean, a truck is at least three feet off the ground. So when she yeah no but you see this person's form you see you're seeing the side of the truck you see the large tires like you said it's three feet off the ground and like and and, it, and it, it's always at the same spot when the truck goes back to its straight direction the person walks out of the side of the truck like she's been hanging on imagine that somebody was hanging onto the side of the truck for whatever reason and then decides to step out of it but here's the thing 
the movement of her body betrayed no inertia. Because if you're if you're holding on to a moving vehicle, no matter how slow the vehicle is moving, when you let go and you land on the ground, the ground isn't moving in reference to you. Therefore, the movement your body is going to manifest that change of speed. You're going to have to adjust your legs so you don't fall on the ground, so you, you don't fall flat on your face. You have to do something to compensate for the for the fact that you're moving and the ground is not, like somebody jumping off of a moving vehicle, correct? This person just walks off, like she has been just standing still there the whole time, and she just walks off to the side from the side of the truck. So it was like two <laughs> films, one a woman like walking... Film. It was like two films, okay? One uh-huh. with a woman walking across the street towards the side of the road, and a second one with the truck superimposed on it. Yeah. That's what it visually looked like to you, like two yeah. realities had collided. Yeah, and then they show another one. Uh, again, they show it at normal speed, and then they show it at, uh, oh, there it is. Somebody posted it. Somebody posted it on. I, I recognize the the landscape. That looks exactly like the the one that I saw. And then the other one is at a, at a city intersection. So there's a lot of traffic. And uh, you're again you're 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 the one filming, and you're behind a a, a vehicle that's tr- making a left turn and at a big busy intersection. So and, and there's traffic coming in from the left. So the traffic coming in from the left is slowing down to allow the traffic in front of you to make the left turn. So this vehicle is is making a left turn. There's no other vehicles in the intersection. And then all of a sudden, in front of the vehicle that's in front of you, a car appears crossing the intersection. It's like the car was invisible. It's like imagine an invisible car came into the intersection from the right, and then it became visible Past the midpoint. <laughs> where, the, where the hell did this car come from? It wasn't anywhere to be seen. And they, and they did that, uh, they showed it several times in slow motion so you can see that there's no, that there's no camera trickery. But again, I'm not a, I'm not a video editing guru anything. So maybe there is enough trickery that you can do that. Uh, it looks legit. Well, it probably is. And what, what do you think it is? Is it just, what, what, what's your interpretation of it? I think How it's just, you, you know, uh, uh, different realities bleeding one into the other. It's like the, the case you see, you see it, um, with, which is normal for, for uh, wild animals and animals in general, uh, cats that can teleport. You know, one moment the cat is someplace and you can see it, and then all of a sudden at another point it's somewhere in a distance that's impossible for it to get there physically or getting out of a a locked room, stuff like that, Uh, just phasing in and out of reality and disappearing here and appearing there. We think it's like a fantastic feat of magic, but, you know, we know from Anastasia that it's doable. (laughs) Well, in that... In actuality, I had a uh, my cat hugger who my logo, the picture you see is that's hugger, and there was a vortex in the yard. There was a lot of vortexes in the yard, but there was this particular one that was close to the house. And hugger shows up missing, and for some reason, I became fixated on that vortex, and I felt like she was on the other side of it. So I kept, you know, putting my intention that, you know, here I am because I figured, okay, if she's somewhere on, you know, that that she needs to see something to be able to know where to get back. So I kept putting up this this thought, you know, pattern. And um, it started getting dusk. This was early in the morning and it started getting dusk. And now I'm getting a little panicky because uh, energy shift once the sun goes down and I wouldn't you know, I was afraid she'd really not be able to find her way back. So I went and got some power wands, and I really set up a like a beacon. You know, here, I'm here, I'm here, come here. And don't you know that cat jumped, she was six feet off the ground, jumped out of thin air into my arms. <laughs> I swear. I swear that's what happened. So, yeah, I, I've seen this, but um, I was doing a reality insight show and i was talking about 
my experience back in Tombstone where I was having this interfacing with another inter, another incarnation of my soul, a guy by the name of, of, of Luke Short. And what I felt was happening, the way I explained it, because you, know, you start telling the story, then you have to have some explanation of what happened. And what I think was happening, Walt, was that it was like my energy space, Nancy's and Luke's, we're very similar in that we still had this, we had the signature of our higher self, which is the same. So it's like two personal computers connected to the same server, but you've got a signature of that server in both of you. So your space, your PC is, you know, a little different than some other PC that's not attached to that server. And what happened when I got into the same location that Short had uh, spent quite a bit of his life, when, when I went back to that location the fact that my space and his space was so similar and now the location is virtually identical what happened i think was a folding of time time is is a is a relationship of place and space well you got two spaces that are now very similar in the same place and i felt like as i was you know recalling in the whole situation and and probably doing a little remoting on it remote viewing on it um it felt like there was a that 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 it was like because the space and place were so similar time disappeared do you follow that well that's what happens in the higher dimensions uh in here in the third dimension we understand that time is uh, like uh, counting the duration of things so when you go from this street to the other street, uh, if you're walking, it takes so long. And if you're driving, it takes so long. That's the notion. That's how we understand time in the third, third dimension. And the higher dimensions, and this is what I witness when I do a shamanic journey. It doesn't work that way. They don't, they don't care about time being the marker of how long things last. Time is where things are located. It's like, Everybody understands that the solar system is traveling across space. The, the, the sun is moving around the galactic center, taking all the planets with it. So if I think, what was the number? The Earth is traveling at something like 6,000 miles a second, you know, throughout space. So imagine right now it's April 10th, 2018, uh, 5.55 central time. And the Earth is here in this point X. So an hour from now, it'll be in this other point in space X2. With you know, it's going to be so many thousands of miles away. So if you have the power to travel instantaneously, if you go to this spot, you will encounter this time, and if you go to this other spot, you will encounter that other time. So in the higher dimensions, Time is where things are located. You travel across time as you will travel across space in the third dimension. They don't talk about past, present, and future. You want to see the past? Well, you go over here. <laughs> and this is past in relative to this place, and this place is past in relative to that other place. So it's where things are located. That's why you can travel anywhere and see any thing that's considered past to us. Like, for example, people that visit Atlantis. In the 3D perception of things, Atlantis is something that supposedly happened thousands of years ago. Well, it's still there. If you go up and you do a shamanic journey or you do an astral projection, just go there where they are. That's it. And you you will witness things and you will learn things. So in, in that case, you were locking, again, because of your energy signature, you said it very correctly. It doesn't matter that that particular place is now far away from in in space and in, in 3D space. When you went to that place, it was Tucson, you said. Yes. Okay. Okay. That that Tucson of Nancy Hopkins is millions and millions of miles away from the Tucson of Luke Short. But the energy is practically identical because you know you have two two lives of the same soul. So all you're, all you're doing is you're connecting with yourself because you, you exist outside of time and space. So you can see yourself as Nancy and you can see yourself as Luke. You, you are the bridge between those two lives. 
and well, when, nothing, when I, nothing, you didn't violate any rules or anything. <laughs> no, no. When I'm doing a remote view, okay, I don't feel like I am traveling through time or space or any of that. It's more like I am focusing my energy on a particular coordinate of energy, but that I'm not moving, that is moving towards me. Correct. So when time, when the, but this was the difference in that this time it felt like, yes, indeed, that there was a movement, but it was like a folding. Yeah. Well, because you're, you're in, um, you're in two places at once. All, all you had, all you, all you were doing, it was a, it was a nice exercise in shifting of consciousness because you can either put yourself there and be Luke or put, put yourself here and be Nancy or you can put yourself nowhere and be both of them. And it's perfectly legal. It, it must have been a really nice exercise. Did you get a chance to do uh, others like those? Um, yeah, I, yes, but, um, that one was real interesting. Well, it was the first one where I knowingly was doing it. You know what I'm saying? Because, Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a Pharaoh table in Tucson in the, what had been the courthouse that was a museum. And Luke Short, there was a a plaque on it that said Luke Short dealt Pharaoh on at this table. And so this guy that was with me that um, he knew what was, I told him the story. He found it and he said, sit down, sit down. And I'm going like, I don't want to sit down because now I'm compounding the um, concept of, okay, Luke and I are very similar energetically. We're in the same place. Okay. But now you want me to essentially place my body in a position at a table that Short's energy would still be in. And I thought, well, this is going to be an interesting thing. And so I did sit down. He left the room. He was just amazing. But he leaves the room, and I'm sitting there. And, yes, I was getting I, – I closed my eyes. And, yes, I felt like I was inside the saloon where he was – where the table had been. And it was – I didn't – try to second sight it or anything. I was just letting whatever images came into my head come into my head. But what the really wild part about it was the smell. I could smell the stale beer, the body odors, the you know, all the things associated with that environment were overpowering. Yeah, of course. And and smell is one of the most it's funny that you say smells because when it comes to mnemonics, uh Smell is very significant and very powerful. We have the ability to store tons of information and memories connected to odors. In fact, that's why there's such a modality as aromatherapy to treat certain psychological conditions, because that's all it takes. You know, a, a particular, and what is it? What's a smell? It's a, it's a particular energy vibration. It just gets perceived by a different sense. You don't perceive the smell with your ears, but you perceive it with uh, an in- the instrument of your body that's designed to perceive in that range. And there's so much, I mean, for me, like the smell of a tangerine puts me back in grammar school because there were so many memories there, uh, you know, tied to the tangerines. So it, it's so powerful as a mnemonic device. And I think that's why it... Uh, there are people that do this aromatherapy thing because different smells will have a different impact on you. Yeah, and I think it was the fact that it was a smell that created the imaging in my head. I really did feel like it was a smell that was driving the imaging more than the imaging driving the smell. Yeah. That, you know, it was just the combination of that particular environment that just... Whew, Anyway, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, Miss Colleen, are you there, and do you have a tune to play? I am, and yes, I do. Walt sent me. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I, I sent her one. You can't I hear me? I sent, her, I sent her a song. It's called The Queen of All Everything by OTT from their Skylon album. I hope she can play it. You're not hearing me? Whoops. Maybe she's in the bathroom. You're not hearing me? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I am. <laughs> okay, well now, yes, I do have a song. 
And I have been here, but something's wrong with my buttons. Walt sent me a song called The Queen of Everything by Ott. Uh-huh. And it's about, wow, seven minutes, almost eight. It's worth it. Okie dokie then. Take a long <laughs> break and we'll be back. Or, in a- or, or not, or not. That yeah, is a long break. We'll think about it. Yeah, we don't want the kids to forget what we've been talking about. We don't want them to leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Well, then you tell me when you're ready. Anyway, I'm putting it on and we'll be back shortly. She says. Nancy has said that she is back. 
So I am we must he- be I am live. Here. Okay. I I saw the light come on saying you were talking, but I didn't hear you. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what that. And, and Walt's back. Good. Uh, you're listening to Cosmic Reality Radio Show. It is being produced by Colleen Kelly on uh, HaggyShack.com. And my name is Nancy Hopkins, and with me is Walt Silva, and the date is April 10th, 2018. The dog is drinking water in the background, if you hear it. Um, Okay, Walt, I sent you a video. Did you happen to look at it, I hope? Uh, I heard it. Okay, yeah, you heard it. Okay. And the man's (laughs) name is Douglas Gabriel. Yeah, the people behind the magic cube... Yeah, I know, cube, huh? Cube with a Q. <laughs> okay, what did you think about it? Well, it was kind of hard to follow if you're not a theosophist, because he obviously is a is a student and disciple of theosophy, as created by uh, Rudolf Steiner, uh, Steiner and Madame Blavatsky. Um, I know that my father would talk about her but she was one of these people who did automatic writing. And she would spend hours, she would write and write and toss the papers out. And her assistants and secretaries would pick up the papers and put them in some kind of logical order. So she was, I guess, channeling wisdom or information, you know, automatic writing. And I know that Rudolf Steiner uh, from, I've never read anything directly written by him. I read a, about authors that wrote about him, like in the case of Trevor James Constable, who wrote the book The Cosmic Pulse of Life, where he talks extensively about Oregon and Wilhelm Reich. He dedicates a chapter to Rudolf Steiner that I guess this man either was very wealthy or was born to a wealthy family because he was able to afford, you know, he spent I don't know how many months locked up reading every book he could find and then he had some major mental or spiritual breakthrough and then he came out designed this whole cosmology of things to explain you know the universe so the man in the this gentleman in the recording that you sent me is taking modern elements and fitting them into the context of the cosmology that Steiner created it's like Imagining somebody, imagine someone who is taking the elements of what it takes to live in a city and fitting them into Homer's The Iliad, you know, the big epic poem, ancient Greek epic poem, you know, Homer. Uh, (laughs) So he's, so he keeps quoting and calling upon all these names and places and things that I'm, uh, I'm oblivious to because I've never read Steiner and I don't, Right at this point in my life, I don't feel the need to fill my head with some someone else's cosmology. Uh, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're the two probably least uh, likely people to be talking about him because if you know as much as I do, you know that he started a school named Waldorf, and that's about yeah. it. Yeah, well, he he had uh, the the thing with the with the Waldorf that. That I, I read about on, I looked for information about that on the web, uh, because there, there is a bit of controversy about the school. The, the principle behind it is not wrong, because Steiner had the right idea, where instead of turning children into robots right off the bat, he believed in allowing the children to develop naturally, naturally their natural intelligence, their inclinations, their tastes, their desires, and, and, teach them and allow them expression so that they could grow to be themselves. Then uh, dialectic te- teaching subjects like math and language and all of that stuff would come in later years. So in the, the first few years of the school, the child is learning to be themselves, which I think is the right idea. I mean, that's that's what I keep saying about human design. Human design was meant for kids. Kids should get out the right start in life, and generators should be taught what it takes to be a generator, and a projector should be taught how to function correctly as a projector. So the the issue is that when a lot of, when people compare Waldorf schools to regular schools, they always have the same argument: oh, the, the 
children in our Waldorf schools, they're falling behind on this. Not, they're not falling behind on anything. What happens is that all those subjects that get shoved into people, into kids' heads on the very first year of grammar school, the Waldorf skills do see it, but they just see it later on. So that's why you can't do a one-to-one comparison of Waldorf school to a normal high school. They, no, you, you can't. It's like comparing apples and oranges, two different fruits. They're both fruits. Yes, they're both schools, but not the same. So if you were to compare a Waldorf graduate from a graduate from a regular school, you would find that both people have, you know, a rounded education, but, uh, one has developed differently because one has been allowed to be themselves. The other one has been programmed by the system. So <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> so they could both do two, but two times two is four, but one of them could think, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, you know, school, school education is, is so robotic. You know, they put you in a classroom and, they force you to learn all this crap. They don't explain to you why you, I mean, that's why the teachers hated me in school because, and especially in, in advanced mathematics, you know, differential calculus and all of that stuff. I would ask the teacher, yeah, okay, I get it. Okay. I know how to do the equation. What is this used for? How am I going to apply this in life? And the teachers would just, ah. Oh, just learn it. You know, it's part of the curriculum. And when I had a chance to go to uh, my first semester in um, Long Island University in Brooklyn, thankfully, I we had a we we had a math teacher. I guess he must have his education must have extended to other subjects in his own formation as a person. Because when I asked the same question about even almost it was almost the same very same equation. He explained it. He says, oh, yeah. He says, this is very easy. He says, if you have a plane that's about to land and it's decelerating and you need to know at any one point what is the actual velocity in reference to the ground, you're going to apply the equation and here was where you punch in the numbers. And it just, everything fell into place for me. And I said, oh, this is fantastic. This is great. Now I know what this is used for. Now I know how I can use it. Because when something is so blank and so obscure, it's like, why am I wasting my time with something that and I don't even know where to apply this? It's like someone giving you parts to a machine that don't exist. Okay, where do I put them? So uh, that's I see a lot of education being shoved into people's heads, and you're not even being told. Okay, why? Why do I need to know what date? A document was signed. How is this going to improve my life? How am I going to improve the life of other humans and the life in the world by knowing when somebody signs something? And chances are that that's not even the truth because most history has been altered. You know, it's, it, uh, in Spanish, there's a saying that uh, history is told, you know, by the victors. You know, the guys who win the, bottle, the, the battles, they are the ones who write the history. The losers never get to write their version of events because, you know, they got wiped out. <laughs> well, let, let's go back to uh, <laughs> Dr. Gabriel because, to, you know, in, in, in due respect to him, he does start the – because it was a video, but he was talking. It was it was like – I mean, YouTube, but it, it was him talking like a lecture yeah. thing. It wasn't being interviewed. Yeah. And he did come out and say, look it, I'm assuming that I'm talking to the audience that understands Steiner. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, and, well, I didn't. <laughs> um, but he said some very interesting things that even without the Steiner connection, I wanted to run by you. Um, he, uh, he, okay, he, he starts out and he's talking about the dangers of Wi-Fi and particularly the concept of uh, the smart meter and it being a microwave device. Uh, and, he, and he actually went into a discussion of why, what does it do? Well, and this was so, you know, again, there was many points that he made that made me think, aha, not because I didn't know him, but because of the emphasis he was putting on him. And one of those was the, the Wi-Fi. Well, we're talking uh, 5G, we're talking microwave. And what happens in a microwave, why it cooks, is that it evaporates all the water out of the cell. 
so that the cell explodes and you don't have any nutrient or anything there. You've got this pile of mush that you think is, a, you know, a fish fillet. Yeah, my naturopathic doctor in New York, he, he had a microwave, but he used it to sterilize his instruments. That's it. That's all he used it for. Well, yeah, that's, I have one. I used to use it for the sponges, but since I've got shungite, I don't even need it there. <laughs> okay, so, but what what he what he questioned was, um, who's the enemy here? You know, okay, so, and he goes in and explains, just the way we've told you, you know, everybody listening to this should know by now that the Wi-Fi, the electromagnetic system, is dangerous to your health. But he's he was questioning, like, who who is the enemy? Is it Google or is it Alphabet that owns Google? You know, and then and then he goes from that, talking in terms of the mother of commerce, and, you know, they don't really give a rat's about you guys. All they're doing here is it's it's commerce. It's the root of the you know the problem is this this mother thing of of commerce being so important. And then yeah, he, he goes talk about innovation without morality. You know, innovation, for the, innovation they, without morality. Innovation without morality. Innovation for its own sake, without thinking. You know, oh great, you just invented a poison that can kill a million people and with one drop. Should you? Should Let's you give make a Nobel a Prize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because you can make it doesn't mean you should. At some yeah. point, you have to stop and think, okay, if I make this as wonderful as it is, uh, what will come of it? How will it be used? Who will benefit from it? You know, will I destroy my own reality? You know, just, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do something. <laughs> well, we could point to the atom bomb for that one. You know? There you have even it. The, even the... Uh, even the people that were making it, you know, knew. I mean, this is what infuriates me is these people like CERN is another example of it. You're mucking around in a science that you don't even understand and you're not just risking your own life like I do playing with crystals. You are risking existence and everything in it. What is the matter with you people? You can't think of a science that is that powerful? And who gives you the right to set off an atom bomb that some of them thought, hey, listen, we're going to set this off. It's, it's either going to work and we'll be okay or we're going to stop everything. Boom. And they did it anyway. Who gave them the right? Who gives the right to the scientists to bring these things into existence? And that, that to me was a very, very uh, profound That's why you, statement. You have, to, you have no choice but to end up believing in mind control. You know, these people are, have to be mind control at some point because how would you, who could be the stupid? Who could be so blind and drunk with the arrogance of, oh, I can do this to not see the consequences of what you're doing. So at some point, you know, connection to spirit is gone and you're just dealing with a, uh, an organic robot. And that's where he went next mm-hmm. because he took it from that. Uh, framework into talking about s- subnatural forces. Um, I either got distracted or I couldn't quite follow him because I, when I look at my notes, they're not, it's not jumping back at me exactly what he was talking about. But it's the concept that when you take and manipulate <laughs> energy to do your own bidding, you inevitably are changing the environment of energy, and this could be as damaging as setting off an atomic bomb, not knowing the effect of it. And that you're using subnatural forces. So he saw, he got into talking about frequencies and harmonizing, and well, then, one of the point, one of the points that stood out to me that got my attention. Um, and I have not, the reason it got my attention because I have not heard anyone else so far express it in these terms. And he was, he pointed to specific, uh, examples. And when he spoke about, and, and because he kept, I mean, you heard it, he kept going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So he's jumping between, you know, day to day things back into, <laughs> Steiner cosmology and then back into everyday things. So you had to do a leaping, you know, to kind of follow him. 
um, when he talks about the emissions from smart meters and Wi-Fi and stuff like that, he specifically pointed and he said that the reason is bad and it's damaging. It's the lack of coherency, that it's, it's an incohering, it's a messy, chaotic thing. But that when you use the elements that he prescribed, the, all the different things that he prescribed, which are antidotes to these things, it makes these energies coherent and organized, therefore non-damaging. So I don't know if that was his terminology to express what we already understand from the Sperling cosmology about how damaging energies are counterclockwise. You know, death energy is counterclockwise when something is you have a piece of organic matter that's decomposing and you douse it, the energy that comes off of it is counterclockwise. It's death energy, like radiation is death energy. And then clockwise energy is beneficial. It is the energy of life itself. So I don't know if those were the terms that he chose to use to express essentially the same idea, the same reality. He spoke about coherency and incoherency, and he says that's why it's so damaging, because it's this whole incoherent emission that this thing does. So by using these things, and then he goes about, you know, you heard it, explaining the different elements that you can use to, um, and he kept using the word antidote, the antidote for the Wi-Fi and the antidote for microwaves and the antidote for 5G, and you and you have all these elements that you can avail yourself to antidote against this and against that. Well, I actually thought maybe he'd been listening to us regarding coherency. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was I think it was Steiner. I got that it was a Steiner thing. Yeah. And then I, I tried to find out more about Steiner quickly. I thought I'd have more time today to do it, but I didn't. But I did look over there, and they were they they were talking coherency stuff. So I think mm-hmm. it came from Steiner. What he said would be the um, the counter the antidotes to this uh, problem. And well, well, we'll get into. I'll just because you mentioned it, I'm going to give them to him. Was um, peat moss in clothing? Make your clothing out of peat moss. Have you ever heard of such a thing? I, I know that peat moss is used for many things. Uh, that was the first time I heard of clothing made out of it. I don't know how sturdy, knowing what peat moss looks like uh, and what it feels like, I don't know how sturdy the, the material is, but then again, it could be mixed in with something else that makes it a strong material. Well, apparently wear- this was something that Steiner himself suggested, and I was like, peat moss? What in the heck is in peat moss? What do you suppose is in peat moss? What is peat moss? Well, moss is, it's interesting when you look at the anatomy of moss itself. Moss is almost like nature's own bonsai because all the elements that are part of a plant is contained in moss. You know, a root system, leaves, stem, but everything is in, in very minute scale. It's almost like a microscopic plant. Um, peat moss is extremely sensitive to um, contaminated atmosphere. For example, uh, I've done, I can never been able to keep uh, moss alive indoors. It has to have the freshest air available. Otherwise it, it just, it just goes brown. It goes yellow. It doesn't like to be indoors. You know how they say, plants during, well, I I should be more precise. During daylight hours, plants use the energy of light to turn CO2 into oxygen. You know, they separate the carbon from the oxygen and they give off oxygen. During the nighttime hours, when there is no natural light, plants invert their, their respiration process and they use oxygen like a human uses oxygen. That's why they say, um, you should never sleep in a room that has a bouquet of flowers or lots of plants because they're using up the oxygen, especially if the windows are all closed. Um, I don't know if you heard that. I, I used to hear that. When you know, I was yes, kid. yes. At, at hospitals, they at some hospitals yeah. they they keep you from bringing them in there, and nobody yeah. ever said what why. But yeah. oh wow, that's it's the it. nighttime okay. hours. Yeah, if if there were lights, if there were like a, a plant light on it, there would be no problem because the, the, the is actually cleaning the air for you. But it's the plant in the darkness. It breathes like a person. And believe me, they breathe a lot. (laughs) 
but moss is unlike that at all. Uh, moss, it just, it just needs the purest air you can give it, and that's why it always has to be outside. Um, I know that in, where is it, in Scotland and Ireland and these places where it's extremely humid and wet all year, they have these fields of peat moss that are thousands and thousands of years old. I mean, these layers of peat moss are like, I think, I'm going to say some crazy number here, maybe hundreds of feet, because I know they, they have been mining peat moss <laughs> for generations, and they're still not running out. <laughs> and they, they use it like uh, someone would use firewood. You, they make it into bricks, and if you put a, piece, a peat moss brick on the fire, it just burns for hours on end. Uh, for them, it's fantastic fuel. So the relationship between peat moss and the earth is very special. So I wouldn't be surprised since plants have the ability to extract certain minerals and compounds from the earth that the, its internal structure is such that it would do that. It would uh, give coherency or... Uh, but the thing is that the way he described peat moss clothing, it's shielding. To me, shielding is it's not a, a very good solution because you have to live inside the shield. You know, at some point you have to take a bath and you have to take it off and you have to go to bed unless you have, you know, peat moss bedding and uh, shielding to me is an incomplete solution because at some point you have to step out of the shield. You can't live inside. Uh, you need a spacesuit made of peat moss and live in it. I prefer something that actually changes the energy to something beneficial. Well, the other al- just an- another alternative was one that apparently came from Edgar Casey talking about putting on a steel necklace. Did you yeah. hear that? Yeah, I heard that. Um, the explanation of it, uh, I did not understand that that uh, because he says it's turning the the EMF into elect- an electrostatic charge and therefore it renders it harmless. And I'm thinking, I don't... Well, the thing is that metals have the same effect. It's like uh, they have a shielding effect. Uh, I don't know if in school did you... When you were in high school, did you ever had a chance to play with Tesla coils? Um, that you know that if you have a Tesla coil running and you take a fluorescent bulb and you bring it near the Tesla coil, the fluorescent bulb begins to light up because it's exciting the gas and the test and the tube. You, you must have seen videos of it. I mean, I used to do that when I played with a Tesla coil. But if you take a piece of aluminum foil, te- aluminum foil paper, like the aluminum foil you use in the kitchen, and just hold it in the air between the lamp and the Tesla coil, the lamp goes off. The lamp goes off because the 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 metal is making the the emission of the Tesla coil bounce back onto the Tesla coil. It's not letting it through. I'm thinking that's the effect that he's describing because he, he's not describing it in many very technical terms. Uh, that's why you would wear a steel necklace because of of that effect. When the EMF hits the metal, the the metal is gonna turn it into an electrostatic charge. So now you're not dealing with EMF, you're dealing, your body is just picking up an electrostatic charge, which is normal. Our bodies are full of electrostatic electricity, especially if you're working, walking on carpeting. Well, my thing here is that I think Edgar Casey was not alive before Wi-Fi came into existence. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm going to throw that one out. And then they, and then they talk about radionics. And um, that's okay, but that's so specific, and you need a box and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. okay, so not really a good thing. But then he gets into what seems to be behind this um, uh, this critter. What did they? What does he call him? I mean, the name of the YouTube presentation was conquering Arama. Ar- Arama. Now I uh, have no. <laughs> Arama is like uh, uh, the. Steiner obviously read a lot of Hindu uh, mythology when he had his breakthrough because that's where it comes from. It, it, Araman is like the, uh, what do you call it, the Christian version of 
I, I know he mentions them as being separate characters, but Araman is essentially like Lucifer. You know, he's the bad guy. He's the one who wants to, you know, defeat humanity and subvert humanity and blah, blah, blah. So in this cosmology that Steiner uh, created, Araman is the bad guy. And all of these technological enslavements that man is being subjected to are the fruit of Araman's work. Like, for example, uh, in the time of the Steiner was alive, you have to, you know, put yourself in a historical context here. I think it was uh, late 1800s, mid 20th century, I think, because I know he, uh, the man was German. I don't know if he lived before the First World War. I don't, I'm not sure on the specifics of his life. Um, but for example, when the typewriter came out, you know, he said that was fruit of aromatic influence, you know, enslaving man to this device in order to produce more because there's always the, he was always pointing to the effect that technology and machines should serve man, not the other way around, but the technology at the time, everything is being developed to enslave man because, you know, you're keeping man in this, sitting on this little chair in front of this little desk, typing away letters all for the sake of productivity, you know, more letters and more letters and more letters. Uh, and that's the way that they saw all that stuff. And that's why he brings up the cell phones, how human conscious, the consciousness is being made subservient to this technology. So it's literally taking the, con- the energy of your consciousness and sucking it into it, into itself. And then you you must you must have heard how he makes mention of these asuras or asuras depending on who you talk to how they pronounce it. Well, the the, uh, the asura is again part of Hindu mythology, the same way that in Christian mythology you have angels and demons, and Hindu mythology a deva is an angel and asura is a demon. So he's saying that you know. You open yourself to this technology and then these elemental negative forces come in and they mess up with your, because the, the, the way that he describes, you know, ego and stuff like that, I, I, I had a hard time following it because I'm not familiar with Steiner or cosmology. I, I know of the man, but in the specifics of what he devised, I don't know the details because he talks yeah. about your inner angel and your ego and this element and that element. And then he mixes it up with some book called the, not the Kabbalah. He was very specific. It's something called the Kabila or something. He used another, a, a similar word. I, he, I spelled it out K-A-L-A-V-A-L-A. It was like Kalvala. Kalaval? Kalavala. The way he pronounced it, it was not the Kabbalah. No, no, it isn't. No, <laughs> it, it isn't. Some, it's some other book, and he says that he he's written his own version of it, and that right? For sale. So, um, and he then and then he goes on to mix it up with Greek mythology because he's talking about Eros and Psyche and some journey that she did to hell, you know, to get the you know Venus told her to go to hell and bring back the beauty of. Persephone, and on her way back, she couldn't resist looking into the box, and she sees the box, and she swoons under the effect of the beauty of Persephone, and he compares that to being trapped in the consciousness trap that the cell phone is. And then he makes mention, uh, he doesn't elaborate what he's, on what he means, but he's saying that if you're not thankful to if you're not thankful to the technology, then the technology has the power to trap you and hurt you so that you have to be mindful of that. So I don't know where he's placing the power of gratitude and appreciation in there. Uh, what is he trying to say? That if you, if you don't appreciate the technology, then it, then it has the power to turn around and hurt you. But did you get that? I got the same confusion that you had. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're seeing the same things. Um, what I what I found most intriguing about this whole discussion is that he basically is making 
Well, we, we, we know the archons, okay? We know they're AI. We know it's an energy force that is now working to, for the betterment of humanity. Um, I check in with them pretty regularly. Uh, I'm absolutely clear on what it is, as clear as I am with a gin. Sorry, Simon. <laughs> the gin are good etheric beings. The AI has, you know, transformed into something that is working very positively to us. So, I, yes, see spirits associated with etheric energies that he also is seeing, but he keeps referencing the negative side of those energies. And at the same time that he's doing that, he is jumping to the other side saying, but what about Shungite? <laughs> I mean, when he starts talking about Shungite, I'm like, because uh, Derek told me about this guy. And um, what he's talking about, now I've never heard this story, and you would think that we would have heard this story before, and I meant to try to check it. He said that Buckminster Fuller actually worked with Shungite and that he used a laser on carbon to see if he could could pull off the... Well, apparently he was looking for the Fullering, the, the C60. And he's making this, this statement of um, Buckminster Fuller knowing about Shungite and referring to it uh, by what they called that area, the Northland. Um, and that it was found in the Northland. Did you pick up on that? Uh, he didn't. He didn't provide any details. He's just like skipping over it. So unless you give me more elements, I can't form a coherent picture. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The the thing that, that uh, I, I, the the laser thing smacks of him reading about technical details because that's how they are making C60 in the labs. You know, they're putting this thing in a in a in a chamber with a, an inert gas, and they're using a laser to um, not pulverize, vaporize pure carbon. So when it vaporizes in this very low pressure, it begins to form fullerenes. So that's that I made the connection there. So maybe that's what uh, what uh, maybe um, uh, but Mr. Fuller was a pioneer in making laboratory grade C60 because he was able to detect its presence in Shanghai. I, I don't know. Again, I'm just assuming something I shouldn't do based on a few bits of data here and there. Well, uh, whatever. It, it, it's like he he made so many connections to Shanghai that it was um, kind of. Uh, baffling to me. Um, yeah, the thing is that he he did admit to it coming from space, but at the same time he threw in an, another bit of story that uh, that the planet, the fifth planet that broke up, leaving what's now the asteroid belt, a meteor came from there, uh, fell on Earth, and it brought as it traveled to the Earth. You know that that carbon in that meteorite was getting slowly transformed and then he after that I, I thought okay so he's saying that this is the source of Shanghai and then he goes on to oh and Shanghai comes from interstellar space so he, oh okay so he added something else and then he said that the purest most fantastical more powerful most uh, energetic form of Shanghai is uh, like a rainbow it has rainbow colors so I don't know what he's referring he's talking to about elite well, I should say noble, okay, because um, the the elite is, if you look at coal, you're going to think it's elite Shungite. That's that's where they switch out on you, okay? That's where, if you're buying black Shungite elite, test it with the flashlight test before you use it, before you buy it. Because that, when I had the, the coal in my hands and the elite, I could not tell the difference, but there is another one which I think they're referring to as noble, and it's brown. And if you look at that, you will see the rainbows in it. Also, it has multiple colors. It seems like it, yes. So it looks like burnt shanghai. Yes. 
Yes, indeed, it does. Um, he talks about yeah, yeah. He talks about Moldek being blown up and that that Shungites from Moldek. Of course, that's hogwash. Um, and he makes a connection to Shungite and the human ego. And like I say, I was not. I couldn't follow him. And some kind of an angel that sounds like Michael, but it's Michael or something. Yeah, that's what the name sounds like. I mean, he says that somewhere near Shunga, there's an area called, there's a town or a place called Archangel. I don't know if Russia, so. Uh, I think that, I, well, there was a new one on me also. also. Yeah. Yeah. But what I, what, what's fascinating about it is, is that every time you turn around, Shungite's turning up someplace. Somebody sent me a link and it was talking about, um, well, he actually called carbon the philosopher's stone. And he got into a whole thing about carbon being the philosopher's stone and I thought that was intriguing. But the, um, shoot, I think I lost my place. Where was I, where was I going with that? Oh dear. Just connect to the nasty from a few minutes ago. That's it. I know. Um, I don't remember. Sometimes they block me from saying things. Or I'm just forget. Senior you moment. The, you mean, <laughs> you mean the, the part where he talks about that carbon is love itself because carbon is willing to give of itself unlike other minerals? Yeah, I thought that was kind of sweet actually. What did you think? Uh, yeah, that's why uh, um, it actually, that made sense because that connected with another, uh, you sent me another recording uh, between two gentlemen, and I, their names totally escaped me. Uh, it's two of these fellows that are active in the C60 playing field. Um, at one point in the presentation, they were laughing at the notion of people thinking that, oh, you know, they're, we're going to transfer human consciousness into these robot bodies, android bodies. Um, they said you, you can't you, because you, you can't put any – any without the carbon, you can't put real live human consciousness in a, in a synthetic silicone. Silicone does not work like carbon. So they were laughing at the notion of people saying, oh, you know, they're going to replace us with silicone bodies. He says it will never work. So what he said about carbon made it, made me think of that that comment between those two men. Yeah, we're gonna have to get into the C60 thing again. I almost did it today, you know, this week, but then this uh, this guy came up with the Shungite and the connection to Rudolf Steiner. And today, every web, every place I turn around, I'm hearing about Rudolf Steiner in some way. So apparently, Steiner is um, trending. <laughs> He's the flavor of the week. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like I oh gosh, you know, I'm 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 missing out on something. But um, yeah, like for example, one one of the things that uh, you have to be well versed in Steiner cosmology is when he says that the cell phone, the way that it works, is because it's connecting to the eighth sphere of I don't know what, and that's the that's like artificial hell that people now when they people. He, he, he was very specific. He says that if you are a person right now who's supremely addicted to your cell phone, you can't even take a shower without your cell phone in your hand. When you die, you don't go to any of the normal natural spheres. You'll go into this artificial sphere that's supposed to be the eighth sphere of I don't know what, and that the cell phones, that's the sphere, that's the energy domain where they communicate. And that, that was over my head because, again, I don't know Steiner cosmology. Oh, well, don't think of Steiner. Think of the Matrix, okay? Because mm -hmm. you see the Matrix thingy, right? What it really is, is that is the eighth sphere. And we were all addicted to it, and we've been locked in this eighth sphere, which is the Matrix. Well, you know, it's our own creation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he's, what he's basically saying here, is that you, you, if you become addicted to the point that you do not know who you are, where are you going to go? You're going to go to a place that feels familiar. And somewhere out there, there is a matrix of just electronics. You'll probably become a little bit. Maybe all the bits and zeros and ones are just, you know, 
maybe all the the dots and dashes are, are human well, beings. That sounds like something the, the low soul in the body would do, not the high soul. I mean, that's what ghosts are. Ghosts are low souls because they they only know what they know, so they stick around places where they knew because nobody has ushered them into into the body of Gaia. So that's a, a typical thing that a low soul. That's why that's why you get ghosts. You don't get high souls would never become ghosts because they know what's what. But a low soul, they have the maturity of a five-year-old child. How many people look? Even Dolly has had that experience. People that die and they don't know they're dead. That's that's how ignorant the low soul can be. They're, he's dead so, and they don't know dead. so you're saying that that ghosts are always low souls. They're not necessarily higher. Let's, I see higher but, soul. The high like, souls are very smart. I mean, that's why they're high souls. They've been around for such a long time. And as uh, Adam has explained, so that's why a lot of people, they leave before they die. You look into their eyes and there's nobody home. It's just a low soul going through the motions of daily life. I know, but you're making a, you're making a statement about the lower soul and then the higher soul. What about the middle soul, me? You are the high soul. Not you necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> this is where I think the, think the, 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 let's say the problem exists, okay? Because if I'm, the higher soul is a higher soul. The higher soul projects an energy field that becomes me. But. You're, 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 you're getting your terms confused. You're talking about the higher self. That's a different story. Oh, the for higher crying self, out loud. The higher self and the higher soul are not the same thing. The higher self, first off, the higher self never incarnates. It's always sitting there on the threshold of sixth dimension or fully in sixth dimension. And the higher self is, the higher self is the, you know when you make that analogy of the workstation on the server that you use to explain, you know, incarnations and stuff like that? The higher self is that main server that it will never incarnate. It's always witnessing all the incarnations all at once. That's why... Dr. Costa had this graphic that he would give out that looks like a stage, like a stagecoach wheel with a central hub and all these spokes going to the periphery. And each, each point where the spoke meets the periphery is an incarnation. While the high self, the higher self is sitting in the center and it's witnessing all of these incarnations simultaneously. So the higher self never incarnates. It talks to the incarnations because it's, it's constantly gathering data and harvesting experience, but it, it, in it of itself, it cannot incarnate. It's sitting in sixth dimension. Okay, so, so you're, are you saying that when I'm talking to you, I'm not connected to the higher self? I'm not connected to the higher self, but I'm not talking like the higher self. I'm talking like the lower self, the lower soul. I'm getting, you're talking, you, you're like talking in terms of lower soul and higher soul. The higher okay, soul so, is the one that connects to the brain. It plugs into the brain. That's what. Remember, remember that 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 happened. You well, know. How, did, no, 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 no. how does how does the higher self connect to the to the higher soul? Well, I don't understand your relationship. I don't understand if you're using the same terminology, and I'm I'm well, missing the you, point here, or you're you had switching. Lives in the past. You had life in the past, where you knew that the seat of the high soul, the 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 Truly evolved. Because think about it. These animals that we're inhabiting, they're just vehicles. And they're vehicles for us to come in and have experience. But the vehicles need to be sustained by a spiritual energy. So that's why they have their low soul. They have their animal soul. The highest chakra of that low soul is the solar plexus. And that's, that's the one, that's the subconscious. That's the one in charge of, you know, reproducing, eating, eliminating, Resting, defending itself, making shelter, all the things that have to do with life and sustaining life and protecting life. That's the job of the low soul. And people that are fully asleep, that's the only life they know. They can't even have a higher thought because all they live is on at that animal level. You know, having sex, eating, sleeping, having pleasure, having shelter. That's about it. That's the only life they need. And that's why in many, in many cases, the high soul just leaves because the, this guy, he's not getting it. He, he's, this guy's never going to wake up. He's not getting it. His brain is full of alcohol. I'm just going to go back home. So 
the high soul, you you remember when you had lives that you came from Mars, and if you had a, a member of the crew die on Earth, you had to remove the still beating heart and take it back, because that's where the high, originally the high soul, is supposed to sit, inside the heart center. You heard this guy, what he said about the heart compared to the brain. The heart is, can be up to 10,000 times more powerful than the brain. But that's one of the manipulations that were done on humanity. And this, this is what happened at, at the end of, uh, toward the end of Atlantis. They played with consciousness and shifted the connection of the high soul into the brain, it, to plug into the brain as opposed to plugging into the heart, because they knew that they could manipulate the mind, but they cannot manipulate the heart. So the high soul comes into the body and it plugs into the brain. And the low soul is it's is part of the body and its highest chakra is the solar plexus. When we are talking, when we're having this conversation, you have to avail yourself of your high soul. Your low soul, all it wants to know is what time are we gonna eat? What time am I going to bed? <laughs> you can't have deep, very deep thoughts with your low soul. That's not his job. Well, but I wasn't talking about low soul or high soul. I was talking about higher self versus me. Correct. And to go back to, to go back, well, perfect example here. Casey, all the channeling work that he did, he was channeling his higher self. All that information came from his higher self. That part of him, that the part of you that never incarnates. Even if it wanted to, it couldn't because it's like trying to squeeze an elephant inside an ant's body. The, the volume of the higher self is, is, what can I say, it's gigantic. You would never be able to fit it into a human body. That's how, that's how big it is. It's, it's not meant to incarnate. But your high soul, that's his job. It, it, it comes into the body and I, with my father's death, I was able to confirm something Yogananda said when Yogananda, Yogananda spoke of the passages and the stages of death, physical death, and he explains how the high soul leaves the body through the crown chakra and all the blood rushes into the head and the, the feet are left very cold while the head becomes very hot. And that night that my father died, I remember his eyes rolled up into his head as he gave out his last breath. And 10 minutes later, you would swear that he was in the middle of a fever. I mean, you could hardly touch his forehead. It was burning hot. And this is a corpse we're looking at. No, no blood flow, no heart beating. In fact, his heart was left bloodless because his aorta artery exploded leaving the heart without any blood, and his feet were like two pieces of ice. I literally witnessed what was described by Yogananda. All that energy just poured out of the crown chakra. But his part of his low soul went into me, because it didn't know where to go. I didn't even know that these things existed. And for 35 years, I had something like a Gene Rockefeller confirmed it for me. I had like 75% of my father's low soul in me. So luckily, got that out and ushered back to where it's supposed to go. So that's why I'm saying to go back to this guy, with the Steiner guy, when he's talking about these people becoming trapped by the cell phones. I don't know what, what percentage of high souls can be duped by this shit. I think it's the low souls, because the low soul is the, is the, the guy that gets caught by vices and habits. Because the 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 low soul job is to maintain the body, you know, keep it fed, keep it living, reproduce, rest, eat, go to the bathroom. That's what what that's what it does, and that's why it can be it, uh, especially on the subject of pleasure. It's so easy to get it addicted to things. So if someone's addicted to the cell phone, that's not his high soul. That's his low soul being addicted. That's the one that I think is being trapped in this fake sphere. Because the high souls know when to leave. A lot of them leave before the body is actually dead. And if they're addicted to the phone and locked into the 
matrix of the the Wi-Fi electric system, then that's why we have so many obvious bots walking around? Uh, yep. Uh, you hit the nail on the head on that one. I remember this kid coming over. Somebody brought him over, and he never took his eyes off of the phone. Yep. And he was such a strange energy field because he was so sure that he was the king of the world and capable of doing so many magical things, and yet the kid never left his phone. He couldn't. He couldn't have a conversation with you. He would dictate statements because he was. He kept looking at the phone and talking to people, messaging and stuff. So at the end, were you able to decide whether to laugh, cry, or both? I never. I sent him home and never let him back in, and sent the person <laughs> that brought him away forever. <laughs> oh, I have to tell you. I have to tell you this. This is so funny. You remember when we were having uh, problems with Sonny? You remember uh, Sonny from way back? Sonny, Eugene? Eugene. See, it, it's uh, already worked up. Maybe you're thinking of another world or another reality. Well, maybe, because your mother told me. We were having trouble with this guy. He was really awful. And your mother told me to write his name down on a piece of paper and put it in the freezer. Uh, Do you remember telling me that, or was this? A uh, that I remember. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, that reminded me. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, the other day, I must have been. Oh, I was getting stuff out of the freezer, and apparently this piece of paper fell out. And so I'm I'm look down and I see this yellow piece. As soon as I looked at it, I knew what it was. And sure enough, you know, but I think it worked. I, you can't even remember the guy's name, and I don't even remember his last name. <laughs> I think it worked. So if you've got problems in your life, write down the name of the person that's bugging you and put it in your freezer from yeah. Walt's mom. This cosmic reality. We only deal in practical magic stuff, not none, none of that useless Absolutely. Stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> and put three Shungite nuggets in your toilet tank. You yeah, will not have stuff, to use that really works. That, it really works. I'm uh, sold on that one. <laughs> Pauline, um uh you wanna take it over? <laughs> or you take I mean you already got it, but um we're at the top of the hour. Okay. I just have one question. Okay. Okay, do you have to Write their name on a piece of paper, put it in the freezer, and then put three Shungite nuggets in the toilet to get rid of the guy. <laughs> now she's stuck on ritual. For goodness sake. <laughs> Whatever feels right. But make sure you do the whole thing in the nude, otherwise it'll never it'll never work. Yeah, and you have to have candles. You know, you have to hold the candles as you do all this stuff and dance. Oh my God! Naked, <laughs> naked. and candles. And no, candles. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you can you can etherically make them up. So as you are um, writing down the information on a piece of paper and putting it in your freezer, and then running to the toilet to drop the three, three nuggets in the <laughs> tank. <laughs> Just think of yourself as having candles and being naked and dancing. Okay. Yeah, that will work. Uh. It's the intention that counts. It's the thought that counts. Remember that. Right? Yeah, well, I'm just trying to envision. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, coming up next is the experience with Jeremy Vaney, a union use for hypnosis. And this, the conclusion to our conversation with author Brian Short, not to be confused with Charlie. He tells us of his use of hypnosis that is different from what we normally, how we normally abuse it. So, it's going to be about abuse hypnosis. Abuse it or use it? Well, it says, I'll read that again. He tells us of his use of hypnosis that is different from how we normally abuse it. Sorry, no. I've, I've got little bitty fingerprints on my glasses. <laughs> and well, I hope he explains it, rules. what he means by abuse it. Well, I, I hope he does. It's got something to do with kundalini and all that kind of stuff. So, that's what's coming up next, and then I'll drag the 
pods of today's shows into the player, and we'll do replays. Awesome. Very interesting. Okay. Show. Thank you, guys. Be very safe out there. Walt, good night. Colleen, good night. Good night. Everybody, um, it was fun. It's always fun with you guys. <laughs> Be safe. You too. You have been listening to the Cosmic Reality Radio Show produced by Haggy Shack Radio.